Hey folks, it's Chris, uh, back again after a few days, um, just felt like coming on and making another video, um, hope everybody's well, uh, yeah, this, uh, video, um, is a pretty simple one, it's just, uh, record show, uh, a recent record show that I went to, like, last month, it's a local show here it's a show i've been going to since wow probably since early mid 80s maybe in mid 80s i think um yeah uh you know, i was just gonna come on and show uh some records i got at this last show it was a pretty good show actually just basically because of one uh, my friend mark um who always has amazing stuff and he had just a plethora <laughs> of amazing stuff including um like uh half of these uh came from him and half of them were like long some uh big uh things off my uh list so to speak um so i figured i'd come on and um yeah just show it's about a dozen records um that i picked up at this last show last month and uh yeah pretty simple theme uh so Anyways, uh, uh, the last video, like when I played it back later, um, I realized the music, you know, could have been a little, uh, probably could have lowered it a little bit. Um, so I tried to play something a little quieter and more serene this time uh, for in the background. And so that's what's in the background. Uh, Japanese temple music, Zen, Nabutsu and uh, Yamabushi chants on a lyric word. Something um, kind of relaxing. Uh, not much at this show, unfortunately for me, in the way of world music or avant-garde stuff. Uh, but I got a few things in that realm. Um, and that's probably, that's what I'm going to start with. Um, the first is... Uh, uh, Chinese opera and folk themes on the record. Um, this was, uh, I think this was, um, originally came out of Taiwan. It was a Taiwanese pressing, but distributed in the U.S. on the record. Um, I got two along those lines, Chinese opera and folk themes and Chinese flute concerto also on the record. And these are um, kind of typical uh, Chinese opera, classical uh, music, um, lush, nice background stuff, nothing super substantial. Um, you know, it's sort of in, somewhere in the world between traditional classical and world music. Um, I probably like, I like this one a little more because of the, the flute being predominant in this and I like flute a lot um, so I mean these were a few bucks um, so I grabbed them but again they weren't they're nothing um, they're nice to play in the background but they're nothing really that interesting in my opinion um, but still for a few bucks why not um, so there's those this is much more interesting as usual with the Chinese classical music in my experience is uh, Chinese classical masterpieces for the Pippa and the Chin by uh, La Lao Tu Sun Yu. Um, in my experience, anything of uh, the Chinese music that I have, anything that features either duets like of the Chin and the Pippa or Pin Pippa or the chin, like a string solo instrument and duets are really interesting. This is no exception. This is really good. Um, and uh, actually, I need to upgrade this because this isn't in spectacular condition. Um, but there's a whole kind of a sub-series on lyric Lyricord of like Chinese classical masterpieces for mostly for stringed instruments that are very good and have a lot of surprises on them and this is uh, no exception really really nice um, so that was a cool pickup um, 
Yeah, Chinese classical masterpieces for the Pippa and Shin on the record. Uh, the one ostensibly 20th century avant-garde record that I picked up actually was really good and it was only a record. Um, it's this one. Uh, Daniel uh, Kobalaka on violin and Robert Hughes conducting. Um, it's on Desto, which is a very underrated uh, label, in my opinion. Um, uh, there's a, I have a handful of Desto records that are really good, 20th century records, and a lot of them are very cheap, and this is no exception. Uh, like I said, it's three pieces. Henry Brandt's Crossroads, Glenn Glazo's Raka, and Lou Harrison's Concerto in Salandro. I love Lou Harrison. Um, this is excellent. I think Crossroads is solo violin, um, which is uh, four different parts like edited together. Um, this is that piece in both con Concerto in Salandro and Raka were influenced by Eastern music and particularly Asian music, uh, which is a, with Lou Harrison is a lot of times the case. Um, the Raka piece is, cold, uh, is Daniel on violin and tape. And the Her Lou Harrison concerto in Salandro is like kind of a small chamber setup, but it's an interesting, um, an interesting instrumental setup. It's Celeste, tack pianos, gongs, uh, iron garbage cans, iron pipes, claves, um, and uh, it was composed uh, on a trip that Harrison was making to Japan in 1961. Um, really, really nice. Um, and uh, Kobalaka plays great on this. This early Kobalaka is very really young. He later uh, put out some um, nice. Uh, I know Carm has, I think, has a lot of his later records. I I do too. Some nice '80s records um, that go more in a new age electronic direction that are very actually very lovely for what they are. Uh, but this is early, uh, early like 1970, and a little more avant-garde, but still a very nice 20th century record that's pretty cheap um, on Discogs and in other places. Uh, yeah, Henry Brandt, Crossroads, Glenn Glasso, Raka, Lou Harrison, Concerto in Salandro, played by Daniel uh, Kobalaka on violin and conducted by Robert Hughes on Desto. Uh, a little bit of uh, Prague, New Age Prague, kind of uh, first Froling second record strings from 1979 on Brain. Um, actually, in Maryland, these guys were actually these guys were part of the one of the few Prague pure, I guess, Prague bands I actually like SFF in Germany. Um, uh, Schickard. Furs and Froling made uh, three records. Then Furs and Froling uh, broke off and did some solo work. Their first record of Maryland is, is a favorite of mine. I really love that record. And um, this kind of continues sort of in the same musical path, but with some interesting kind of diversions and a little more, um, a little more of an intro, a little more of a rhythmic percussive pulse on the tracks. Uh, but it still has that lovely sort of new age pastoral progressive sound, a lot of mellotrons and things like that. And, I mean, how can you not love a record with pink flamingos on the cover? Um, but uh, this is much better than I expected it to be, actually. Um, so I'm glad I picked it up and it was really cheap. Um, and I, I really like it. I played it a few times. Uh, very good. From 1979 on Brain, Furs and Furling Strings. Uh, the next record is Jazz, uh, Jimmy Jewel and Ears. I'm amazed on it. Mm, excuse me. Affinity from 19, I think 
think 77 ish or 76. Jimmy Jill's saxophone player uh, in his band Ears um, from the UK. This is um, uh, more kind of like uh, what I would call like sort of like it's closer to like the soul jazz side and it's you know it's soulful kind of like laid back kind of funky all roads um the slower tracks i had you had two records i had the other one and this one is a little bit better the slower tracks have a nice feel to them especially the opener freddy blue is a great track um but uh, to I would describe Jimmy Jewell and his band Ears as like a really good sort of what I would call like a imagine like a just kind of a really good UK house band at a jazz club like Ronnie Scott's or something. They're professionals that play can play. I mean, there's no innovation or anything mind blowing about it, but just good playing and and uh, good listening. Um, and it's not an expensive record. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was sealed, actually. I took the shrink off, but, uh, 1976, I think, Jimmy Jewel and Ears, I'm amazed, from, yeah, an Affinity, the UK label, and Affinity, um, nice for cheap. Uh, that was pretty much, like, the, uh, the cheap find. And then the next six were, like, really... <laughs> really really big uh finds and made some stuff that just was mind-blowing to find uh in in the states um and uh you know i uh the only reason i was able to afford really like this next group of records was uh i sold a bunch of records and uh i sold a couple things to uh, dave local bandography so much love to dave because i mean without dave buying those records from me i probably wouldn't have been able to afford all these in one shot so uh thank you dave um uh yeah i'll start with the uh four are french one is german and one is usa good old usa and i'll start with um this one from the usa david rosenboom's future travel from 1981 on street um i have a few other rosenboom records but i did not have this one um and uh this one is a little less it's still experimental but less avant-garde than his other efforts like on music gallery editions and uh like brainwave music and earlier things he did um this is sort of like a, a pseudo concept about traveling future travel it's a journey in sonic imagery um what's interesting about this is it's all bukla which is uh rosenboom used a lot of bukla um there's uh, a lot of like kind of um, world music elements mixed in here so um the tracks aren't purely in purely electronic there's acoustic instruments on here like um pod rattles tibetan cymbals syrian dumbback ocarina marbera um other things like that and there's like a processed sort of female voice on occasion um very cool record that um i've known about for years i just never 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 picked it up um so it presented itself there like is often the case when you just find something that you you know you have so many things you're looking for at least in my case that i mean you, i just can't pick up every single thing every single time so um the time was right and the price was right so happy to have this david rosenboom future travel from 1981 on street uh this is harmonia dino on rock on brain this is rock on brain the rock on brain pressing of the very first and seminal record by harmonia called music von harmonia um and the only afford affordable version unless you wanted a modern day reissue of this record um i have several in this rock on brain series i have um that's my version of Sugar Time by Cluster. 
for Zuckerzeit. It's the one I have. I'm really happy to have a, a vinyl copy of Harmonia. Um, I had a CD for many years um, back when I had CDs. Um, so I was really, really stoked to find a uh, vinyl copy of uh, this um, version or pressing. Uh, just called Dino, named after the track Dino on the, on the record. Um, if you're not familiar with Harmonia, it's Cluster and Michael Rother from Noi. Um, yeah, just seminal stuff. Uh, really nice copy too, and, and affordable-ish compared to like in a, a brain pressing. Um, so really happy to have that finally, Harmonia. Uh, and the last four are French, and I'll start with like the the more the pretty much the most common to the rarest. Uh, this is uh, Patrick Gauthier's Bebe Godzilla. Patrick Gauthier is a keyboard player who played with um, Heldon, played with Magma. Um, also, he had a, had a band called Weeder Jordan, which is a great Zool band uh, from the 70s, made a, uh, at least one record that I know of. Um, I don't have it, unfortunately, but um, this is on Psy Records, distributed by French Warner Brothers. Um, a lot of uh, people that he's played with in Weederhorn and uh, Christian Banders on drums, um, from Magma, of course, David Rose from Transit Express, uh, Richard Pinhas. Um, this is more, um, this is 81, so this is more jazz oriented, much closer to like contemporary jazz, jazz fusion sounds. Not, doesn't really sound like Heldon or Magma or his, or Peter Jorn. The Zool elements on here are very, a little bit muted. It's more just good, kind of contemporary French jazz, jazz fusion um, sounds, but a nice album that I've been after for a while. Uh, yeah, Patrick Gauthier, Bebe Godzilla from 1981 on Psy Records. Uh, this next Frenchman is just a crazy, crazy mad, matter. Just a nutter, this guy. Uh, this is e, uh, Jean-Yves Labat, Transition 1, from 1978 on CBS France. Um, Bot's kind of a character. He um, uh, did a lot of work in America. Um, he put out an album on Todd Rundgren's Bearsville label. Um, I don't know if that was Rungan's label, or, but he worked with Lundgren, or Todd Rundgren, sorry. Um, and uh, an album called M Frog, early in the early 70s. And um, uh, it's pretty crazy. I have that one too. But this is um, a later one that he did um, that's even crazier in some ways. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think this originally came out as something called, uh, excuse me, the, um, uh, I think it was called like the Underwater Orchestra or something along those lines in Canada on Barclay a couple years earlier, but this subs out a, a different track than that one. And came out in 78 and this is a great the title tracks one of my favorite things on here oh, what is this it's a mix of sort of crazy like kind of avant or prog funk that's going on here there's some like cosmic disco elements um uh, some of the synth on here sounds like bernie warrell at times it's crazy and then um a couple like really stark, great dark kind of French electronica tracks, which are my favorite. Like um, Transition One being very, one of my very favorite tracks. It's just great. 
Um, this is an awesome record. I, I like this. It's, a, it's fun and it's also uh, dark <laughs> at the same time. I and mean, it has this crazy, crazy cover. Um, never see this, um, so I was really happy to get it. Uh, Jean Yves Labat, Transition One, from 1978 on CBS. Uh, and then the last two were like just insane finds at a record show, like in the Midwest. Um, this next one, a lot of people probably will know. Um, this is uh, Ariel Kalma's, Ariel Kalma's Interfrequence from, I don't know what year, Interfrequence, around late 70s, I think. This is essentially a library record that Kalma did, and it's just uh, amazing. If you're not familiar with his music, um, he's great. I've had his first record for many, many years, but this and Osmos, another record he did um, uh, around this time, have always eluded me. And this, this was, an, I was just so shocked to find this um, that no matter the cost, I had to grab it. Um, and you know, it's somewhere between. I think Stunty made a good observation about Kama. Is he? He knows how to ride the line perfectly between like new age, psychedelic, and the avant-garde um, very well. And uh, this is obviously super cosmic and a uh, wonderful record um, with him on all kinds of things, not just electronics, but like harmonium, clarinets, organ. Um, like I said, a lot of you a lot of you folks may know this because it was reissued not long ago and um, you know it, it had some buzz around it um, but this is a, a nice original um, yeah so absolutely insane if this believe it or not this isn't even the top this normally would be the top find ad for me and there's actually something that's even beyond this for me the, um, but this is Ariel Kalma Interfrequence on, um, I forgot the label, it's, uh, it's a library label, um, I think it's called MP2000, it's a label. And then last but not least, and this, this was just a crazy, crazy find for me, because this was, a, a, this has been on, like, near the top of my uh, French progressive, electronic, experimental, whatever, want list for a long time. This is uh, Dieter Bonin's uh, Lier Luminaire from 1982. This is a private press. Um, very, very tough to find outside of France. Um, an absolutely beautiful, ethereal, kind of experimental folk record, you know, guitar led, but there's other instrumentation as well, um, the best way I would I could describe this in a general sense, with this is what I what I call a golden hour record. Like if you've heard the term with nature, call you know the golden hour in nature. This is like a musical equivalent of the golden hour. Um, this is just absolutely amazing. Um, the cover I always love the cover. It's really simple, black and white. Um, and uh, was totally blown away when I saw this in, in Mark's uh, crates. Completely, I, I'm pretty sure I was the only one at that show that even knew what this was. And um, this was not cheap, unfortunately, but I didn't care. Because um, it was one of those times where I actually had, you know, I had the money and I mean, the, it, it was there in front of me, so I, I just could not, I had to, uh, I had to pull the trigger, and I'm happy I did it. Um, just absolutely blown away to have a copy of this. I love this record. Uh, Dieter Bonin's Lier Luminaire from 1982. This is a self-release by him. This is his second record. His first one is nice too, but it's a little more straightforward than this. 
not quite as transcendent. Um, but uh, yeah. And uh, you know, as always, any things that any of these records that you see here, if you're, you know, they're all, they're all I, I'm pretty much online somewhere to listen to if you're curious. And you know, because a lot of times I don't feel like I can give, I can't really give it justice. Plus, it's coming from my perspective. And just because I love it doesn't mean it's necessarily something you might love, but. You know, a lot. What's nice now is a lot of the music you can sample it online and see for yourself, see how you feel about it, see how you connect with it. But, anyways, um, what are we at? We at 25 minutes. Um, yeah, I don't want to make this like a half hour. So, um, I'm glad everybody that commented on my last video for the tag and, and seemed to be a lot of people enjoyed it and. Um, you know, and appreciated it and got something from it, which is what I, what I really love about making, when I do make videos or when I'm in the mood to make them, I'm, I'm just happy that people find anything interesting for themselves really, um, to explore. Um, and, uh, it's always, uh, a good feeling just to share what you love amongst people that are mutually, you know, love music. Um, regardless of taste just we all love music and that's pretty much I think the great unifier really in this community is you know everybody here is here because we love music and, and appreciate music on some level and it resonates with all of us so um, yeah take care folks maybe I'll be back again at some point who knows um, but anyways take care peace